it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 168 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens more chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Bantam Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Today we're brewing rich and delicious French roast. And it's strong and I need it. Where can everybody get this delicious and strong coffee? Phantomroasters.com. And use the code FLUFFYBUTT for 10% off anything on the website. It's a great code. And follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Are you ready to sip some of this delicious coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. They're here, new and improved, Grubly's World Harvest. I'm a longtime subscriber and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus orders $40 or more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Grubly Farms makes food and treats for healthy pets and planet. To support us and Grubly's, go to our website or our show notes and use the link. Try it today. Okay, so how are you doing? Okay, over here. How are you doing, though? I'm living. That's good. Alive is good. Alive is good. If you could tell by my voice, I've been sick, but, you know, I just want to feel better. I just want to feel better. We've had sickness in our house for the month of January, and it's now into February. So we just can't catch a break over here. It's rough. My sister was telling me the other day that more than half of my niece's grade in school was out sick. Yeah. I mean, this one has hit me the worst. Mm -hmm. Like, it's been really tough the last few days to get through. But, you know, we're here. You just keep going on, right? You keep doing it. It's got to go away sooner or later. Right. You got to start to feel better and you pay your dues (laughs) with sickness and then you move on. So that's where we are. But this is our February 13th. This is our Valentine's episode. It is our Valentine's episode. I'm going to throw a little love out here to Sherry. Sherry's one of our regular listeners. She has a beautiful sultan hen named Cotton. And Sherry reached out to tell us that after listening to the sultan episode, she agrees that sultans do have a very hard time in the heat. She's got to supply a lot of extras for Cotton to keep her cool. So essentially, we were right on there that sultans like a temperate climate. If you have them in the heat or the cold, they need extra provisions. Yeah, they're little chickens, kind of like the Houdans are little. They don't like the cold as much, and you have to make some provisions for them. It was nice. She sent us a nice picture over an email, and yeah, thank you very much. We like seeing those things. Yeah. So Valentine's Day is going to be low-key around here, probably around your place, too. Yeah, I think we're working, actually. (laughs) Oh, we are. That's right. Okay, so on that note, if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, Head on over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button for two reasons. You never miss an episode and they count them. So we grow. It's a good thing to do. And it's simple and it doesn't cost anybody a cent. If you're looking for some other ways to help support the podcast, you can tell a few chicken loving friends about the show. You can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can check out our Etsy shop, t-shirts, mugs, tiny chickens. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. And the other thing you can do to help support the show is visit our website and our show notes, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah? Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the chicken love box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. 
In the August box, I absolutely love those amazingly good smelling nest box herbs and that giant roll of rooster stickers. They're great. I love the wood decorative plate. It's going up in our studio today. And with all my baking, those egg separators are going to work awesomely. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Running, 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 run real fast, run real fast into the breed spotlight, yeah. Yeah. That took a lot of energy to do. It looked looked like it did. You look like you're tired now. Oh, I'm tired now. Okay. I was like, so where this, did that come from? This little burst of energy. Yeah, two seconds burst. And now I'm like, I'm ready to sleep for six hours. Okay. <laughs> so the breed spotlight this week is the runner duck. That's why we were running. We were running. This breed spotlight was your idea to do the runner ducks. And I got to tell you, by the time I finished writing this spotlight, it was so much fun. I, I would thought you were going to say, after I wrote the Breed Spotlight, that I was going to say I wanted runner ducks. That's what I thought you were going to say. Well, I might be saying that later in the conversation. <laughs> I might come out. Well, I thought that it would go well with our upcoming guests for the main yes. topic. So yes. we try to build our show to go around guests that are on the show. So right. this week is the runner duck. Runner ducks. Historically called Indian runner ducks, the runners are one of the most interesting and unusual domestic duck breeds around. They have a very different body and bone structure than the mallard-derived farmyard ducks that most people are used to seeing. The runners do not fly, and they don't waddle like most ducks. They They run. Right. They run. They walk, and they run upright. And very early on, they were called penguin ducks, both in the UK and here in the US. I can see that because people, that's how they look when they walk around or run. I mean, very upright, yeah. Of course. I mean, they don't fly, they don't waddle, they walk and they run. That's why they're named that. (laughs) That's right. Another surprising fact about them, they are great layers. Runners are most definitely heritage breed ducks. And they're currently found in the recovering category of the Livestock Conservancy's poultry conservation list. I think that they have taken on a new popularity coming. I mean, right now, I think... A new thing, and this is why we're kind of mixing in the other poultry into our breed spotlights, because a lot of people have mixed flocks with other poultry. And, you know, some people have all chickens and some people have chickens and ducks and some people have chickens, ducks and geese. So, you know, it might be fun to learn about the other breeds. Right. But they're pretty popular. They're pretty popular. The runners are extremely popular. They're also a very, very old breed, and they evolved as herding ducks in the islands of Southeast Asia and the surrounding areas. In Story's Guide to Raising Ducks, Dave Holdery mentions that there are hieroglyphics of runner-type ducks dating back more than 2,000 years that have been found in temples on the Isle of Java. They were running that aisle. They were like, yeah, we're running it, and we're running the aisle like we're the bosses of the Isle of Java. Some of the chickens from the Isle of Java might have something to say about that, but yes. (laughs) And just a quick note, historically, these were called Indian runner ducks. Right. That happens a lot with birds that came out of Asia, usually by European sea captains. 
it was a thing back in the 15, 16, even 1700s to call native people in Asian islands, Indians. I mean, Christopher Columbus did it with Native Americans. Right. And then during Victorian England, there was this big brouhaha because people were claiming they actually came from India. And the runner ducks don't look like they came from India at all. No. So eventually, one, because we like to give people their proper names, and two, because the name didn't really even fit, the Indian has been dropped. And these are usually just referred to as runner ducks now. Right. So back to birds on, say, the Isle of Java. Herders would use these really long bamboo herding wands, and they would take the ducks out in flocks and drive them to the fields and the rice paddies, and they would glean leftover seeds, insects, larvae, and any other food they could find. So over time, the breed evolved to move more quickly and efficiently in flocks. Nice. They were most likely selected for body shape and for good egg-laying ability because those are the two most important features, you know, as herding ducks there. In the evenings, the herders would take the ducks back home and they would spend the night in these bamboo or cob pens. They would lay their eggs in the morning and they would go back out to the fields. They're really workers. They worked. Very much so. Very much so, yeah. Runner ducks first showed up in the UK around 1850. They were brought home by a ship's captain who is anonymous, and he shared them around his home county of Cumberland. A lot of those earliest runners that came into the UK ended up being crossed with barnyard ducks. And what happened is, in time, arguments broke out amongst breeders and fanciers about what were pure runners and what were not. Yeah, it's kind of that same old story of the arguments between people of this isn't a purebred, you mix this. I mean, it's the same. It's always still the same. For time, what happened is over time, there were more and more birds imported. More and more of the runners came in and they arrived in the UK. And then there were breeders that were more careful about keeping the purebred runners and protecting the breed characteristics. I mean, it comes down to what you're trying to do. If you're breeding to maintain a breed, you're not going to cross. If you're a farmer who really, the reason a lot of those farmers were crossing their barnyard ducks with the runners is because they were trying to increase egg laying. Right. Because the runners are really good layers. So, I mean, it's the age old story of trying to mess with a breed that has some really good things and make it into something else because you try to mess with the breed. You know, there's a breed for a reason. It's a heritage breed. It has the characteristics that it has. Right. And it it does come down to care and breeding because ultimately some of those early crosses, the ones that were done carefully and thoughtfully, some of them became the foundation birds for the light duck class. And many of the light ducks are known as excellent layers. Right. Right. I guess that would include the khaki Campbells, the magpies. Yeah. Exactly. It's not clear When the runners arrived in the U.S., but it was definitely sometime in the 1800s. And guess what? There were similar battles here over true types and true colors and all of those things. Wow. Well, runners, I guess because, you know, we were, we had come out of hen fever a bit and the runners are showing up in the U.S. and they're really interesting and unusual. And they became very popular on homesteads and small farms in the late 1800s. And... There was a lot of crossbreeding here as well. And when you have a barnyard setting, there's going to be. That's what kind of happens. Right. Unless you were taking pains to keep your birds separate, you know, maintaining breeding pens. That's what happens. Yeah, that's what happens. Everyone comes that is on a farm. It's like, what kind of breeds you have? I have a bunch of barnyard mixes because everybody's there's no other way to say this, but free love. Right. So everybody's having some fun and you get some mixes. Since it's Valentine's Day, we can say those drakes are known for being lover boys. Yeah, exactly. So eventually things calm down here. The first variety admitted to the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in 1898 is a runner called the Fawn and White. It's one color variety. It's the Fawn and White. Okay. So that was the first. In 1914, white runners and penciled runners were admitted. And the remaining colors... We're not admitted until 1977, and we can go through them real quick. There's buff. Chocolate. Cumberland blue. Gray. And silver. I like the name Cumberland blue. That was the the town, right, that they went to. And guess what? Those Cumberland blues are beautiful. 
it looks like there's quite a lot of variety for ducks for the runners. Yes. Now, I got this from Dave Holderreed's Stories Guide to Raising Ducks, where he mentions there are a host of non-standard colors of runners found around the world. And they include the fairy fawn. The golden. The blue fairy fawn. The Saxony. The blue fawn. The pastel. Trout. Dusky. Khaki. Cinnamon. Lavender. Lilac. Brown blue penciled. Blue fawn penciled. Emery penciled. Porcelain penciled. And splash. I mean, quite the variety. That's one of our longest going back and forth with naming varieties. I mean, and I like the names of them. I mean, right? They're really evocative and kind of romantic. I love them. I mean, Dave Holdery obviously said that the runner ducks have more colors available than like pretty much any other waterfowl. Yeah. I mean, I think when people get ducks, there's a few breeds that they're going to go into usually. And the runner ducks are one of them. They're so fun. Yeah, they're really fun. Okay, so this is a tall but rather small-bodied duck. Okay, the runner drakes generally weigh in at about four to four and a half pounds. They're not big heavyweights, okay? While the duck hens are three and a half to four pounds. They're not big. Think about a leghorn size. This is like weight-wise of a leghorn. Right. So they are extremely upright with posture from 45 degrees to 75 degrees above horizontal. (laughs) That's very straight. That's pretty straight. They could go practically straight up and down when they are alert. And sometimes seeing, you know, an animal like that, it's like a penguin standing straight up, right? Very penguin it is. They have a long, slim neck and a slender straight head and bill with their eyes set high on the sides so they're cute they're and really they're cute. cute they really are many people describe them as bowling pins i've heard this myself around town mm-hmm. they look like bowling pins or wine bottle shape if you had a flock of them you could give them wine names that would be cute oh that's clever you could you really could they have tight feathering And it adds to their sleek appearance. But most ducks do have the tight feathering because they're waterfowl. They have to have protection for their skin if they're in the water at two degrees, you know? I think the runners, of all of the waterfowl, the runners have the least down on them. And that makes sense, too, looking at their appearance. But, you know, they evolved in an Asian island setting. So that makes sense. Right. I mean, the Isle of Java was a warm place. It wasn't cold, right? Right. So... The drakes do have a curled sex feather on their tails, but otherwise they look very similar in appearance to the females. Mm -hmm. So they have a little curly tail, but that's about it. Yeah. That's the only difference. Just if you're going to get them as day olds, make sure you get them from someplace who is good at sexing them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because that could be a problem. That could really be a problem. Okay. So let's get into the numbers for the eggs, because this is what people have been waiting for. Those egg numbers, number of eggs produced for runners were all over the place. Yep. Depending on their strain, whether show or utility birds, we saw as few as 180 and up to 250 to 300 plus eggs. Yeah. Yeah. So apparently if you can get your hands on a good laying strain, they like will give you leghorn numbers. But if you're getting maybe more of a show line, you might get like 180 to 200 eggs, which is still... That's average. Yeah, it's average, you know, so it's not a bad number. There's for ducks are going to give you a bigger egg also than chickens. Right. They are richer for baking. So they have some egg wise. They're a little different than chicken eggs. So you can use them differently. Yeah. Okay. So eggs are white or light to greenish blue. We've heard this too. Like they can lay any different color of eggs. Like you don't know until they lay the egg, the first egg. What it's going to be. That's kind of across the board for all ducks, right? Well, this is a little different with the runners because sometimes, depending on the color strain of the runner duck hen, it can matter. Okay. So one color of runner, the hens may be more likely to lay a white egg where another variety, there might be more blue-green. Right. So we have Easter eggers that lay blue eggs, but right. there is really a, not a lot of big, like within that breed... Like, they're not going to go from white to brown to blue. Right. They're blue or green egg layers, right? Yeah. So this is a little different. 
So it's kind of like that grab bag. You don't know what you're going to get yeah, until you get Yeah, it's cool. Okay, so like other small body poultry, they have been selected for egg laying. They do not often go broody and are not known to be good mothers. I could yeah. see that. Yeah, apparently even if they nest and they lay a clutch, they're up and gone. They have stuff to do. They're not sitting on eggs. They remind me of the leghorn in the chicken world. Yeah, yeah. They're kind of like, look, I do what I do. I run around and that's what you're going to get from me. I mean, some people said their runners didn't even bother to lay in a nest. They just laid their, the eggs when they were out and about doing their stuff. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, just drop out. And I got I got too much stuff to do. I got too much running. Girl, I, got too much go. running. I can't go sit in a nest. Runners may look like one of the most impractical of all duck breeds, but they are arguably one of the most useful of all the duck breeds. They lay tons of delicious eggs. They are master foragers. They will eat garden pests. They will fertilize on the go. Of course. They make enchanting additions to a backyard poultry flock. How could you be sad watching runners? If you haven't seen them, look up the videos online and they're really fun. They're also used in another interesting way. You may have seen runners used for herding dog demonstrations and competitions. Yeah, there's a lot of videos out there of like a bunch of them running together. Yep. That will make you happy. It really will. One of the reasons they're so good for training herding dogs is because they flock so tightly and they move so quickly. Yeah, they like to run together. Yeah. Now, runners are sometimes described as highly strong, which is probably the duck equivalent of flighty, because they tend to cluster together, as herd animals do for safety, and they have a quick startle reflex. And I mean, that's a survival mechanism. So you have to have say. that. If you're poultry, you have to have it. Right. Runners are very active ducks. Yes. I mean, they very rarely stop, but they also have very gentle personalities. They would be great for a homestead. They would be for wonderful. This is a consideration that I hadn't thought about. I was putting together my Nestera wagon coop that we're going to use for the gosling grow outs and eventually is going to become a duck coop. Right. And I was working on this after I was writing the Spreet Spotlight, and I thought, oh, this would be perfect for runners because it has a lot of headroom. That's a real thing if you're going to keep runners. You need to make sure their Cooper house has plenty of headroom because they're so vertical. Oh, yeah, definitely. You can't have them in something short. I mean, they stand straight up. Right. So they have to be able to walk around. They are small-bodied, so they don't take up a lot of space, but they need that vertical height. As we've said before, ducks are naturally cold-hardy, And runners will also do well in hot climates because they have small bodies and they love water. However, remember they don't fly. And ducks, just like chickens, do need shelter and protection from predators at all times. They're our responsibility. We owe it to them. That's a no-brainer. If you have poultry, any animal in this world, and if you own it, needs shelter. Shelter and protection. So here's the question that we should ask. If you want runner ducks, where can we get them? McMurray Hatchery has beautiful runners in several colors. They have the fawn in white, the chocolate, the The blue, and the black. Yep. Metzer Farm is also an unbeatable place to source high-quality runner ducks. Metzer Farms, they're known for ducks. Right. Right. That's what they do. So you can also check, you know, the Livestock Conservancy Breeders Directory if you're looking for local. But the runners are a lot easier to get your hands on now that they're in the recovering category. Yeah, I like that. I mean, because, well, they're popular and they're, you know, I always say it, the availability is there so people can get their hands on them and they keep going on and on. I wish the availability was there for all of the poultry, but unfortunately it's not. So here's the part where I'm going to say, if you have runner docs, put a story up and mention us if it's a video of them running or even just a picture. We would love to see it. Put it up on our Insta. Mm -hmm. Could you see runner ducks in your flock? Okay. A little quick story. A few years ago, I looked all into adding ducks to my flock and I did all the research and everything else way before we started the podcast and everything else, because I'm like, okay, I think I want to add ducks to the flock. I want to have a mixed flock. And Joe was like, no ducks. (laughs) He was like, they're messy. And, you know, he had that what a lot of people think about ducks. You know, you have to have water. I mean, you could have a kiddie pool for their water. You know, I mean, you just need to set it up in a way that you can manage it, whether that's making a built in pond that you can drain and scrub or a kiddie pool that you, you know, dump twice or three times a day. You just have to build it into the care. That's all. 
I have to say, too, I'd like to hear from people who have mixed flocks because there was a lot of stuff out there while I was doing the research that sometimes ducks can be a little rough on the chickens. Especially and that, breaks. Yeah, that was one of the things that stopped me because yep. I was like, I really don't want to combine flock if my chickens are going to be beat up by the ducks. Like, right. And that was one of the major things that why I didn't do it. But if you know, if somebody's out there, let us know what you think. You know, if you have experience with having a mixed flock, just send us some messages. We know our upcoming guest does keep a mixed flock. And she loves them. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. They're back with an innovative new product. You're going to want to check this out. It's an extra large set, a 14-pound feeder in three-gallon water with steep anti-roost lids. They're made of super durable material. You can either stand them on legs or hang them on brackets on your coop or fence. They're easy to remove and clean too. Plus, they look awesome. We personally use Roosties and we're huge fans. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, check out the Roostie store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. UK chicken lovers, this one's for you. Get happy, healthy hens with Eco Nourish's live calci worms. Enrichment, nutrition, and protection in one tasty, sustainable pack. Scientifically proven to support glossy feathers, strong laying and skeletal health, protect from disease, and improve gut health and immunity. You'll also bust flock stress by stimulating natural instincts and get eco bragging rights. Visit econourish.co.uk and use the code COFFEE15 for 15% off your first order. Your chickens and the planet will hug you for it. Okay, so let's move on to main topic. Yeah. Yeah. Today, we are welcoming Lisa Steele back to the show. Lisa is the original Chicken Lady blogger. She's the author of seven books, including the Fresh Eggs Daily Cookbook. She is our go-to expert for all things ducks and geese. Lisa, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me back. Hey, Lisa, welcome back. Welcome back. So we brought you in today. We love bringing you in to fill in gaps in our knowledge. That's why you are our go-to duck and goose lady. I love it. We get a lot of questions about two topics, fermenting feed and deep litter. And they're both these really awesome organic processes using microbes, but neither one of us do them. So you've come in to answer questions today. Yes. And I, I mean, I love these topics when you let me know you wanted to focus on these two topics for the next podcast. I got really excited because I do love them both, use them both. They are super beneficial, not expensive, not hard. They're things that pretty much everybody can do. And I think it's something that maybe everyone's not talking about. So great topic. The process of fermentation like when you're making sauerkraut, uh, kimchi, beer, sourdough bread, like you, you kind of all know that, that kind of yeasty, bubbly, whatever it is. And you could do the same thing with chicken feed, not really pellet or crumble. It just kind of turns into a mushy mass, but scratch grains is great. Or if you use a whole grain chicken feed and you basically just submerge it in water, I use a big glass, like a pickle jar kind of thing. I put it on the counter, stir it up, wait three or four days, you're going to start getting the bubbles, you're going to start getting all the really good fermented stuff on top, and you strain it, feed it to your chickens, you can use that liquid again, add more feed to it, and keep doing it like that. Chickens love it, and it has tons of benefits like other fermented feeds. So basically, that's the concept is you're taking your regular feed, adding water to it, letting it sit for three or four days to ferment, you have to make sure it's covered so it doesn't mold. You know, because otherwise it'll get moldy. And you do have to feed it right away and then discard if they don't eat it that day. You really don't want to keep it hanging around. So the so water that, you just reuse each time you would put, you could put the food back in the same water that you used in the mm-hmm. jar. Okay. Well, and you want to keep smelling it. You want it to smell yeasty, not moldy. 
you know, or okay. if you see mold or whatever. So you do have to have to watch that. But um, yeah, it's it's pretty easy. And as long as you're keeping that feed completely submerged and then you want to stir it up, you know, every time I walk by it, I'll, you know, just kind of stir it up. But that's really all it is. I love doing it in the summer because you're also adding a little bit more hydration into their food. You know, they're eating a, a basically a waterlogged feed, which is yeah. great for hydration, but like other fermentation processes, it does create its own probiotics. Uh, it creates nutrients that weren't in the food. It also makes those nutrients more available to them. You know, chickens only eat as much as they need to get the nutrients and energy they need for the day. So they won't overeat their feed. You know, if you're eating, a, if you're giving them a bunch of like not really good for them table scraps and stuff, they will definitely overeat, but feed, they'll only eat what they need for the day. So because the fermentation creates more nutrients and makes those nutrients more readily absorbed, they're going to eat less. So you're actually going to save money. I've seen anecdotal evidence that they'll eat about 20% less when you're feeding them the fermented feed. And you can also do it for baby chicks. It is wonderful for baby chicks because those probiotics are so good for them and the hydration. Is this something that you should do intermittently with other food with, you know, just regular feed and then ferment it? Or could you feed strictly ferment it? You, you can. If I weren't so lazy, I probably would feed fermented feed always. I'm lazy. You know, it's great. You can you could feed it as their sole feed. You can feed it when you feel like it. You can feed it two times a week and do regular feed the rest of the week. You can put out regular feed for them and then do the fermentation whenever you feel like it. Any that you do is going to be beneficial, but it certainly won't hurt them if you do it. I mean, I know there are some people that that is what they feed their chickens. It's just their routine and that's what they do. I think some people try to make it out to be this really complicated process. And I love the way that you've just explained it and made it, you know, accessible for people and and not something that's hard, you know, like you can do this. It's easy and beneficial. And it's kind of like making apple cider vinegar. If you ever made your own apple cider vinegar, you basically just put apple peels and cores in a bowl of water, you know, press down so they stay submerged so they don't rot. And that does take a little bit longer. It takes weeks and weeks to actually turn the apples into vinegar. But same thing, it's going to start fermenting. You're going to get that beautiful mother on top. So it's it's kind of like a, it's a process that is done with so many different foods. That's fascinating. Two things. The first, now I want to make apple cider vinegar. (laughs) Second is that, honestly, I have my girls on a pellet and crumble feed that I love. And I think they are thriving on it. So... Mm -hmm. I think I would probably try to ferment maybe my whole whole grain scratch that I give them in the winter yeah. and see see what happens there. I found yeah, and they would love it. They would love it. Okay. I found a 2023 study. This is a study based in China in Animals Journal. And I quote, adding fermented feed increased the digestive enzyme activity, ameliorated intestinal morphology, increased Sequel microflora, increased beneficial bacteria richness, immune function, and antioxidational ability of chickens without effects on growth and performance. That's pretty high praise. It makes sense because you're putting more of the good gut bacteria in there that say they do eat some junk that they're not supposed to. They go to the corner of the run and they're like, oh, that's going to help prevent a problem from happening because that bacteria is in there to take care of it pretty quickly rather than, you know, for it fermenting inside the crop. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. And the nice thing, I use the electric dot water bowls in the winter. You know, I plug them into an extension cord and I fill them. You can also do a warm oatmeal in them, but you can also put the fermented feed in them. Because here it would freeze. You know, if I put wet food out, it's going to freeze in no time. But I can put it in those heated dog water bowls and it'll keep it just warm enough that it doesn't freeze for them. That's a great idea. I love that idea. That's Mm -hmm. great. Great. Just for clarification, because a lot of people just don't know this, sprouting and fermenting are two different activities. They're done two different ways. Correct. When you're sprouting or growing fodder, you're basically rinsing your seeds and grains and then draining them. Rinse and drain, rinse and drain. And then they, they it's like sprouting seeds. When you're fermenting, it's submerged in the water and you're only doing it for like a max of three days, maybe four, where sprouting is probably going to take about a week. Exactly. Ready, and fermenting is going to take, you know, days after that because you want to get, you're almost growing sod. 
you know, at that point, right. you want like inch or two high grass. So, and sprouting and fodder doesn't create that same nutrient and you're not fermenting. So it's not creating the probiotics and things like that. Although it is super healthy for them because there's so much in that little seed. So sprouts like broccoli sprouts are much more nutritious than eating the broccoli itself. Right. Right. I do sprout all winter for mm-hmm. my chickens because there's not any greens really for them out there. So that is, I do love to do fodder and sprouting and all that good stuff. It's fun and they like it. They love it. Absolutely. And yeah. it's inexpensive. I've started saving my seeds from the garden that I don't you know, get a chance to plant or even if you have expired seed packets or whatever and sprout those. You can sprout radishes and broccoli and pretty much anything. Just throw a bunch of seeds, you know, into your glass jars. And that's a way to not waste seeds that didn't get planted. It's a great idea. We we love sprouting. We are huge converts to sprouting. Mm-hmm. So when, when you get right down to it, fermenting is this pretty amazing process. It is filled with health benefits. It's a natural process, so you don't have to do that much to it. Probably the biggest question people have, and, and you probably answered this earlier when you said you need to keep smelling it, but how do you make sure your fermenting mix has not gone bad. Yeah, it's it's by the smell. It's, it's going to smell like sourdough bread or yeast. If you see any black spots or mold, it's rare after three days that it's going to be molding. As long as the feed is submerged, you only want to, so you want to only make as much as they might eat in a day. So maybe half a cup per chicken, probably a little bit less. Maybe fill your container up about a third and then to the top with water because as it absorbs the water, it's going to expand. So you don't want the feed above the level of the water. As long as it's submerged and you stir it up, you should be fine. Can you do this with, say, cracked grains in scratch or should it be whole grains? The cracked will work as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's just, I mean, you can do it with the the pellet and crumble. It just makes this big mushy mess. And I don't know that it actually is creating any kind of beneficial anything because I believe that those have been processed. Right. So it makes more sense to just save them for a hot mash and go with actual grains. That's fantastic. Lisa, thank you for guiding us through fermented feed. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be out there fermenting sooner rather than later. (laughs) Now let's move on to the next topic that we want to talk to Lisa about. And that is the deep litter method. We've had so many people a ton, and I'm talking a ton of people coming to us and asking us questions about deep litter. And it's something that Holly Ann and I do not do with our own coops. So bringing in Lisa to talk about it seemed like that's what we're going to do. That's the best thing to do. So tell us about deep litter. Yeah, I discovered this about two years after getting into chicken keeping. Uh, We were living in Virginia, and it got icy and cold in the winter, not as cold as Maine. But just cleaning my coop and hauling everything away and hauling in new straw. It got to be really just difficult in the winter. And I figured there had to be a better way. So I started reading and researching, and came across this old timers method called the deep litter method, which to put it in a nutshell, you are creating compost inside your coop. Every time I post about it, people freak out. They think it's disgusting and gross. And I couldn't imagine not cleaning my coop all winter. And I don't want compost in my coop. And it could not be further from the truth. I actually brought a pop prop with me today. This is from my coop this morning. I basically have composted dirt that I can add to my garden this spring. There's literally no smell. If you compost correctly, a compost pile shouldn't smell. It's not wet. I, you know, if people say to me, well, I have a wooden floor of my coop. Is it going to rot? You can see it's, it's basically composted dirt. This is gold. It's chicken manure. It's feathers. It's straw or hay or whatever you're using as your litter. I mean, it's it's amazing. I was a convert. And if you do live in a cold climate, I absolutely recommend it because it will save you a ton of time and effort, money. It creates, which I'm sure you're going to talk about a little more in depth, but it creates good microbes, which can actually help keep your chickens healthier in the winter. So there are positives to it as well, because I don't normally do something just because it's easier. Like when I decide to do something, it has to be for the benefit of my flock. This happens to be easy and beneficial for them. So it's it's kind of a win-win. I had a quick question. You talk about straw and hay and all these things. Can you use deep litter? with pine shavings mm-hmm. yes okay so so this is 
just to put it basically in the fall, I clean my coop out. I rake everything out. I usually rake it into the run because then, you know, when the ground gets cold, they can walk on the whatever. They like to go through the old litter directly in my compost pile. So you're, you're down to your coop floor, whether it's wood, cement, linoleum, whatever it is. You want to put down about six inches of something, which is going to be your base. So you can use shavings. You can use pine needles. You can use dried leaves. You can use hemp, something like that. On top of that, I like to put straw. Straw is super warm. It's a great insulator. The smaller stuff underneath is going to break down a little bit quicker. So I use that as the base layer. And then you put down a little bit of straw. Then you turn it. In the beginning, probably not every day, but I do like to turn it at least every other day with a rake. Turn it over, switch things up. All the poop is going to be on the top, obviously. So when you flip it, the poop falls to the bottom, especially when it freezes and you can hear the poop falling onto the, so you, so all your manure and everything falls to the bottom and that's where it starts decomposing. So you've got your, I'm not a great gardener, but I think in a compost pile, you've got your nitrogen and your carbon, right? So your nitrogen is your chicken manure. Your carbon would be, which is your, your brown matter would be your, your leaves or straw or hemp or whatever it is you're using for your, your litter. And then the oxygen, when you, flip it over, you literally start decomposing inside your coop. But on the top, you've always got some nice fresh, you know, and all the, all this dirt stuff is heavier. So it's, it's falling to the bottom. And by the end of the winter, you might have three or four inches of this composted, basically dirt that you can put right into your garden because it's been aging all winter long. I also like to throw some scratch grains into the the coop, which I don't feed or water in my coop. Um, mess, moisture, rodents, flies, whatever. But I do throw scratch grains in and the chickens will scratch through the litter looking for the scratch grains and they'll help you turn it over. So you can even save yourself that effort if you want to. I think the important thing to remember, and you're saying this so nicely, is it's easy, but there is a step that you have to do. Deep litter is not just put put the litter in and forget about it for three, four months. You have to turn it over. If not, if you don't turn it over, that's when you're going to come into your it's problems. You're just going to get matted down. You also need to add new, you know, so as you're turning it over, if it starts to look a little bit, you know, wet or like you don't have enough fresh bedding, you want to add new and whatever it is, your shavings, your hemp, your straw, whatever. Um, so you want to keep a nice base. In the winter here in Maine, I keep about a 12 inch base on my coop floor, mostly because the ducks sleep right on the floor, you know, so I want them to be warm. But with that kind of base, it's creating heat. A good compost pile does create heat. So you're creating natural heat as well as, you know, saving yourself the time and money. Yeah, it just, it makes so much sense. And I think people judge without really realizing what it is just because they envision, oh my God, if I didn't clean my coop in two weeks, it's going to look disgusting. And honestly, it won't, I mean, I post pictures of my coop all the time year round and it never looks disgusting. I usually get flack for you that do. Can't really do your coop because you do. <laughs> you know, chickens couldn't live in a coop that's that clean, which makes me laugh because I hardly ever clean my coop. I mean, who has time for that? You know, it's, it's all a, a question of managing it, I guess. And it is very important. No feed and water inside your coop because you are just asking for rodents and flies and bugs and moisture and mess and it's just a bad idea, you know, Here. so the scratch grains or sunflower seeds, you can throw sunflower seeds in, you know, the we were talking, we were whatever. talking about, uh, before we record, we started recording, we were talking about also the size of your coop can somewhat mm -hmm. play a role in whether or not you want to decide to do deep litter. If you have a larger coop, this may be something that's for you because cleaning a really big coop is a major job, right? So, but going in, Going in with a pitchfork and turning it over daily is something that you can do easily and then adding shavings on top or whatever mm -hmm. bedding you choose. If you have a smaller coop, it may not be for you because you can just clean those that bedding out once or twice a week and be good. Sorry, your compost pile. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, some of them have those trays that you even pull out. And honestly, in a in a small coop, even with just a couple of chickens, they're gonna have an easier time keeping it warm with just with their body heat. So it's not nearly as important with, in a larger coop. You know, that extra heat is really nice. <laughs> you had a great idea when we were chatting about this, because I was talking about the fact that a lot of my breeder coops for my Nankin Bantams are plastic. We don't do deep litter in there. And you said, which is brilliant, use a deep litter starter. Yeah. Take a little bit of your, if you 
you have a large coop and then you have smaller for your moms and your babies or breeders or our sick chicken or whatever, take some of the partially, you know, composted litter from your big coop and just put that in your smaller coop. So you're not actually doing the composting in there, but you're just kind of feeding them the partially composted litter. You know, I mean, bottom line, as long as you're not just throwing it away, you know, as long as you're you're composting it to use in your garden or putting it out into your run, you know, over the ice and the snow, I like to rake the straw out, you know, use it again. Straw is not cheap. Shavings are not cheap. No. Hemp is definitely and, not cheap. <laughs> and all of this goes towards building good soil. And most of the world needs good soil, especially if you're gardening. So it's, it's win-win mm-hmm. all the way around. I do the same thing that Lisa does. I take whenever I clean anything out, it goes on the run floor. They always say that you could probably grow the most beautiful flowers in the world on that run floor because it's the best soil ever, you know? Mm -hmm. And I do take that because the ground itself is frozen right now and nobody Mm -hmm. wants to be walking on frozen ground. So that stuff comes out. And if you have the deep litter method, that's going to be adding some nutrients even more into that. This is another thing that everybody tries to make complicated and it's not. It's no, not. it's not. Absolutely not. No. And also when you rake this, I mean, I, I am pretty heavy straw, straw heavy in the winter because it is so much warmer, you know, it's hollow. So it holds the air. I mean, it's just a great insulator. Um, but when you rake that onto the run a couple of times it being rained on or sun shining on it, and it looks practically new, you know, so it's not like you're, you've got like, all this manure now in your run. I mean, that dries up and breaks down. And like you said, it, you know, it makes great soil for them then in the spring to scratch through when there's bugs and worms and all that in it. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. A little bit of the science behind this, again, almost all of the studies are focused on broiler chickens, but there's a lot more studies on litter and deep litter method with broilers because one of the things that happens with broiler chickens is they get a lot of bumblefoot. They're very heavy chickens. They don't move around a lot. They don't roost either, right? They just sleep on the floor. They just sleep in the litter. And then you get keel blisters and abscesses. And so a lot of the studies, and I'm going to link several of them in the show notes just because I thought they were fascinating. A lot of them are focused first on the litter itself. And they found that there's really good reaction to almost all of the types of substrate that will break down. So rice husks, especially in Asia. Yeah. Um, you know, various kinds of hay, pine needle hay, shavings, all of these things. The one they found did not work very well was sand. And I found that in several studies, sand. Yeah, of course. Sand does not decompose. It's got to be, it's got to be organic matter. We talked about this before as educators, we need to give our opinion of what to us works, right? So you do what works for you, but sand has a lot of not great benefits. I mean, it grows a lot of bacteria and fungus and not the great kind, right? It gets wet. It's not a great thing to insulate the coop. It doesn't stay, it doesn't keep it warm. No, you ever walk on the beach after the sun goes down, even in the summer, the beach is so, and you know, what kills me is people who say, oh, but I use a kitty litter scoop and I just scoop all the poop out. So the sand is clean because, you know, you can't see bacteria or microbes or, I mean, like, right. I'm talking from experience. Yeah, I was talking from experience with that because we we go to beaches for vacation every year because we're like, okay, Mm. we're beach people. And my daughter one year got ringworm all over her from the beach itself. Yes. From the beach. I am sand, a lot of flack for that also, but I absolutely do not recommend putting sand in your coop. I mean, worst idea ever, whoever came up with it. I think a lot of, or some commercial farms used to or do or whatever, but you know, that's commercial is not what we do. And. But I commend you for doing that because sometimes it's the harder road because people who say do what works for you and don't take a stand, you're not educating. You're not giving your opinion of what works the best. So and because it you, doesn't work, you know, someone might see a reel of somebody, oh, I just put sand in my coop, best thing ever. Well, they don't see the update three months later when they're, you know, shoveling all the sand out because all their chickens have leg injuries from, you know, hopping down onto frozen sand in the winter or whatever it is, you know. Sand just makes a claggy mess. I mean, I, I think I tried sand early on, very, very early on in part of a run, and it just was a mess. And what do you do with it afterwards? Like That's what I, I want to know. 
and I mean, why you would pay to have a, sand, a truckload of sand dragged in and then when you rake it out, what the heck do you do with a big pile of sand that's infested with chicken manure we and bacteria? I don't. We used it as uh, footing in a horse ring, but most people don't have a mm. horse ring to put it down as footing. <laughs> so. Sure, sure. <laughs> So most of the studies that I was looking at, the gist of them, it, they really, they focused on a couple of things. The first, which you already touched on, is that you need deep litter. When you say deep, you mean between ha half a foot and a foot of litter. Mm -hmm. That needs to be in place. Correct. Moisture control is also crucial. Ventilation, I should add. You need really good ventilation as well. And if you do smell any type of ammonia, you need to rake it out and start over again. If, if you know, the next day or so, you can't fix it by adding more dry materials. And the other thing that they focused on was the overall health of the broilers, because as you pointed out, they will get up and scratch in deep litter. So they're more mobile. The, the litter is staying drier. The ammonia is released. So even though, I mean, I don't know if there's anything else in this world that's more depressing than a, an industrial broiler chicken, but the very fact that this really fantastic natural process does bring them some life improvement. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. It says a lot. It says a lot because it works for them. So, you know, it's yeah. going gonna, gonna to work for other people. And I just love the simplicity of it because so many people make it complicated. And it's not. I love so that Lisa explained it that way. And I want to show it to you again for anyone who may, I mean, this is this is nice for the garden in the spring. I think I would take that bowl from you where it yeah. is and start crocus bulbs in it and put it on my table. And I'm not joking. It looks that good. It mm -hmm. looks great. It's, it it's looks not, great. you know, completely. And because I do use the straw, it does take longer to break down. Although it's great for the soil composition. You know, when you're adding this to your garden, you don't need it to be all fine dirt. You want some some texture and different sizes and shapes in it because it will add some composition and, you know, let the roots get down into the soil better. But yeah, this is good stuff. It looks fantastic. I also found a study that hinted at this, and I can't I can't put this out there as an absolute fact because they hadn't done the research. They just hinted at this. One of the studies was talking about the possibility that chickens scratching and using their beak in deep litter actually has them ingesting some of these microbes. And it's it's a very similar thing to the fermented feed. Just by scratching through the deep litter, they are getting more positive bacteria in their body. Correct. I Yeah, I read um, a study that it's actually creating, I think it was B vitamins also. Oh. That were, wow. but I mean, again, a lot of it is anecdotal, but definitely anything that, that gets them, it gives them something to do as well. Yeah. And we know this for sure. We're going to be talking about it on another uh, later episode. But vitamin B plays a huge part in your health, the health of your chickens. Not enough vitamin B can cause a problem. So yeah. if it adds to the vitamin B level, that's good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Lisa, thank you. This has been absolutely fantastic. I'm sure our listeners are going to benefit from this. I'm going to benefit from this. I'm yeah, I'm going to go read some of those studies and I'm going to add them to uh, my blog as well, because I do find it fascinating. And I think that there's just so much you can do that's not expensive. It's not difficult. You save yourself a lot of effort. And most importantly, it's beneficial for your chickens. So yes, my chickens live a long time. Yours do as well. They don't get sick. You're doing all this preventive stuff that prevents them from getting sick. So to me, it's just a no brainer. And that's the key. It's it's the way to go. It really is. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just thought of something great too. What's that? Taking this and putting it in your brooder with your baby chicks because people keep their brooders too clean. Baby chicks need to be exposed to things to get their immune systems working. So I wonder if putting a little bit, because I've read studies by Gail Demereau, who kind of was like the OG of everything. Exactly. Right? So she, she would actually take chicken manure and put it in her chick brooder. Because you are, you know, starting to expose the baby chicks to small amounts of different bacteria and pathogens. I wonder if putting the deep litter in your brooder would be super beneficial for the baby chicks because of all the great stuff in it. And it has the microbes. I think some of the microbes actually have been found to suppress salmonella and E. coli. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Because it gets the whole the whole gut microbe effect going. Uh, that's brilliant. I love that idea. I'm doing that. I'm Yeah, I'm doing that. 
Yeah, I, I love that idea. Too. I, th- I think it's a great idea. And plus, it will give them something to scratch through. They can practice dust bathing, do whatever they want to do with yeah. it. It just goes to the fact that we can all learn something new every single day. Every day. You know? Yes, it, absolutely. After and I even- love it's science-based. You know, you start with the science and it's not exactly because there's so little study done on backyard flocks, but you can take what applies to humans or commercial flocks or even other animals and apply it and it works. It does work. That's fantastic. I mean, I would just say, make sure whatever like deep, deep litter starter you choose to put in with the babies, just make sure it doesn't smell like ammonia. And I, I think that's brilliant. Put it mm-hmm. as your base and then, you know, put the other stuff and, and then turn it you over. Could even, you could even let it air out for a while, you know, scoop some out and just leave it outside for a while and let it definitely air out and, you know, have a couple days. Fantastic. Nice. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, Lisa, this has been, I didn't think it was possible, but this has been one of our best discussions yet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me back. Always a pleasure. Thank you Always for coming on. You're a friend of the show. And, you know, we, we just, we love that you made it, you make it simplistic for people to understand. And, Sometimes if you overcomplicate things, people don't understand. And I'm I'm not saying that in a bad way, but I'm the same way. Like if something's 20 million steps, I'm going to be like, oh, but the stuff out there going around about fermented feed and deep litter method, everybody kind of is scared of it. And Mm -hmm. I love the way you explained it. So thank you very much. Which is a shame. Yeah. No, I, I like to make things easy and simple and just make sense. You know, if something doesn't make sense to me and plus, I have 15 years of experience. I mean, I've been using deep letter since like 2011 or something like that. So it's, you know, just doing it a long time. Yeah. Fantastic. That's awesome. Well, until next time. <laughs> yeah. Once we know you'll come back. That's for sure. Okay. So we'll talk to you later. Thanks for having me. Anytime. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. We just want to thank Lisa one more time for a really, really great conversation filled with great information, good ideas. And as usual, all the duck love. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so let's move on to... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. So this week's Cracking the Eggs. I mean, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. It is. So if we weren't going to do something for Valentine's Day, what were we going to do? Come on. I don't know. What were we going to (laughs) do? Something for Valentine's Day. (laughs) Well... If it were the day before Valentine's Day and I was like, holy crap, I haven't done anything, I might do this. I might whip up some of these. There's a few things, right, that you could do short notice. And one of which, like, if you forget, you're like, okay, I can bake something. I mean, who doesn't love fresh baked goods, right? Exactly. Let's go through the ingredients. Just a quick note. We call these heart-shaped chocolate mini cakes. If you don't have the heart-shaped molds or pans, you can do this in cupcake tins. You could do it or you can just do a cake, whatever. This recipe will work with whatever vessel you put it in, right? Exactly. It will, yeah. So the thing is, when we were talking about doing this recipe, I even went to CVS to pick up like a prescription for something. And I mean, the funny thing is you can walk into CVS and they have silicone heart like cupcake Pans right. That's in what there. I have, the silicone heart molds, exactly. And they also have like the big rose silicone ones for Valentine's Day. So it's how we have come like that readily at the CVS, you right. can get a heart cupcake, you know, pan, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Okay. So let's go through these ingredients. So we need one cup of all-purpose flour or gluten-free one-to-one, one cup of granulated sugar, a half a cup of cocoa powder, because it's chocolate, come on, a teaspoon of baking powder, a half a teaspoon of baking soda, because we want rice, right? Mm-hmm. A half a teaspoon of salt if you're using unsalted butter. I only use unsalted butter. I never even buy the salted butter ever. If you're doing the dairy-free butter, it is almost always salted. Oh, really? Yeah. I always bake with unsalted butter before my celiac disease diagnosis, but now it's salted for me. Whenever I go to the grocery store, I'm always like, who's buying the salted butter? Salted fake butter. That's what's coming into my kitchen. Okay. And here's our egg. One large egg at room temperature, because we know with baking, room temperature eggs bake better for us. They work better. A half a cup of buttermilk or dairy-free buttermilk at room temperature. 
a half a cup of vegetable oil, a teaspoon of vanilla, a half a cup of hot and strong and black coffee. You can substitute hot water if necessary, if you don't have any hot, strong coffee about, but the coffee gives it an even richer chocolate flavor. Heat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, and you're going to spray or grease your heart-shaped cupcake or mini cake molds, or if you're doing cake pans, you can put a liner in there. In a large mixing bowl, you're going to combine your dry ingredients, your flour, your sugar, cocoa powder, baking powder, baking soda. In a medium-sized mixing bowl, you're going to do your wet ingredients. Combine the egg, the buttermilk, the oil, the vanilla, and whisk that well. You're going to add your wet ingredients to the dry ingredients, and we mix these with a hand mixer and a stand mixer, just because you really want to get everything blended and aerated. Yeah, I mean, that's the other job of the mixer, right? So the right. mixer mixes it. But if you use a stand mixer, it does um, really a, the best job at putting the air in. And it always says, okay, some cakes you say like you beat them to mix them and then you let it go for two minutes. Right. The point of that is not to really mix it. It's to add the air. Into, right, it's aerating. Exactly. It's aerating yeah. it. Then you're going to add the coffee or hot water, whatever you're using, mix it again. Scrape the sides of the bowl if necessary. Get it blended. You're going to pour it in your molds. You only want to fill them about half filled because this has nice rise. It's going to rise. I mean, we're both using the soda and powder for baking. And you're getting some air in there. So, yeah. Yeah. Pop them in the oven to 18 and 20 minutes until, you know, you touch them with a finger and they spring back. Or the- use your handy dandy tester that I you use. Use your cake tester. Exactly. That would work perfectly. You're going to bring them out and cool them completely. Once they're cooled, you're going to turn them out of the molds, and then you're going to make the ganache. We just did a ganache recipe for the hot chocolate cookies, so I'm just repeating that one. Exactly. So we'll have that link. So you're just doing these rich chocolate cupcakes with the ganache glaze. It is simple, it is intensely chocolate, and it is delicious. So good. So good. Okay, so let's move on to retail therapy retail therapy yeah okay this week's retail therapy we want to stick with something fun because okay yes tomorrow is valentine's day if you wait until today to get your honey something well it's okay it's all right so yeah we have two instant gifts and then we have some really great gifts that you're not going to get overnight but they're great gifts anyway so the first one we're going to talk about is The chicken love box, okay? The chicken love box is a great gift for any chicken person, chicken lady out there that loves to get subscription boxes. We talk about it all the time. We do an opening once a month. But the love box is a great Valentine's Day gift because you can go on there and you can order like a three-month subscription or six-month subscription or just one box And then it comes delivered. Right. So if you forget to get Valentine's Day gift, you can go on and order it and then just print out the love box and give it in the card and say, this is coming for you in a month. Subscription confirmation. Yeah, that's super nice. Now, the love box has so many great things in it every month. I mean, it has first aid stuff. It has a T-shirt if you get the mega box. You can pop over on our Instagram and you can see it box opening each month. And it's super fun. We love the stuff that's in there. So that would be our first thing that we wanted to put out there. Chicken love boxes for chicken ladies or chicken people out there. They're great. They're great. The next one, which again is a pretty instant one that you can give and no chicken person is going to be sad to get this, is a gift card to your favorite hatchery like Murray McMurray Hatchery. Like McMurray Hatchery. So all you hubbies out there that are like, we're not getting any more chickens, but if you forget Valentine's Day, you can go over and get a gift card. But you don't have to get chicks. There's a million things on that website to get. There's a ton of stuff that you can get, all kinds of supplies. I can't think of any person who would be sad to get a McMurray gift card from their partner. Seriously. Exactly. Exactly. It's a great gift for Valentine's Day. And you can either get chicks or any supplies or they have T-shirts or they have anything. So it's great. Tons of stuff. Now, the other thing is books. Right. I mean, you cannot go wrong giving books to a chicken lover. Again, you're not going to get these at the last second. But, you know, they're still good to give. So 
when we're talking about books, we have lots of favorites. You can even go McMurray Hatchery and look. They have books on their website they sell. Chicken yeah. Love sells the chicken books also right. on their website. And also, today's guest, she has seven books out there that would be great gifts for your Valentine. Everything from chickens, keeping ducks, chickens in the garden, to her great cookbook. So yeah, lots of options. Now, lastly, you can always go to Etsy and search in chickens. And so many great things come up. It's endless. And the problem with going on Etsy to buy some of the chicken gift is that then I buy myself chicken gifts too. Exactly. You know, one thing that would be a great Valentine's Day gift for somebody is Lenora Dane, their chicken yeah. jewelry. Yeah. On, and you go on Etsy and then you get lost in there. I mean, if you just look up chicken, there's chicken blankets, there's chicken jewelry, there's chicken earrings, there's chicken everything. T-shirts, mugs, anything you could think of. Check it out. Check it out. Okay. So... Happy Valentine's Day to everybody out there. Happy Valentine's Day. Give your sweetie a big hug and kiss and say, happy Valentine's Day to them. <laughs> chicken love. Love the chickens. Yeah. Say, I love chickens. Do you? <laughs> Buy your chickens some kale. <laughs> yeah. And get your chickens a Valentine. Yeah. Just, definitely. You give them all treats. They'll love you forever. Of course they will. <laughs> okay. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week. We are spotlighting one of those ultra rare breeds, kind of a check-in to see how they're doing. And that is the red cap. Yes. Also known as the Derbyshire red cap. We have the wonderful Ginger Stevenson from McMurray Hatchery joining us next week to talk about Murray Fest Midwest. Yay. Welcome back, Ginger. Cracking the eggs. We're doing classic popovers. Oh, yeah. Fun and delicious. Ah, retail therapy. This is a good one. Duluth Trading Company, free range undies. With your poultry on them. And yes, they do have them. And do we have them? Yes, yes we, we do. do. <laughs> okay. So what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.